So that brings us on quite nicely to another function of the liver, still related to uh, nutrients, but now related to fat metabolism, how the liver deals with fats. So let's think about this situation now. So here we have the liver again, and the liver is involved in fat metabolism. Now, as we know, the functional unit of the liver is the uh, hepatocytes, and these liver cells are able to process one type of fat into another, which may be needed in various areas of the body. So fats, for example, are needed for the production of cell membranes and cell organelles. The cell membranes are phospholipid bilayers. So fats are absolutely essential. And fats are also needed in numerous biochemical processes throughout the body. And one thing that the liver cells will do if there's excess amounts of fats or indeed excess amounts of protein and carbohydrates, excess amounts of protein and carbohydrates will be converted into fats for storage, particularly a triglyceride. So the liver will store some triglycerides and will produce triglyceride fats for storage in different parts of the body, as we've mentioned. So if you want to put on lots of fat, which you probably wouldn't want to do, but if you did, you could do that by eating huge amounts of fat or by eating huge amounts of protein or indeed large amounts of carbohydrate because the energy component in proteins and carbohydrates can be converted into fatty acids by the liver for longer term storage. And this, of course, is good because it's a survival mechanism, because if you've got plenty of food for a couple of weeks, then it could be months before food supplies become available again until the young men of the village make a kill or the season comes around where we can start foraging for roots again. Because, of course, we are designed to survive in primitive situations. This is why a lot of this physiology is as it is. So the body will store fat whenever it can, because who knows what's happening to food supplies next week. So the liver is going to be converting any calorie containing, any energy containing nutrients into fat for long term storage. Um, now, you might have noticed that quite a few people drink alcohol. So here we have the individual hepatocyte, the individual liver cell just here with its nucleus. Now, normally what is happening is the liver will take in fats, biochemically process these fats, and then excrete them again from the hepatocyte. Or it could be taking in carbohydrate, or it could be taking in protein and converting those to fatty acids, which will then be exported from the cell for storage in various parts of the body. So that's good. But the problem arises if there's alcohol around about the cell. So there's alcohol in the liver, as there will be if you drink, because alcohol is systemically absorbed. Then for the period of time that the alcohol is around, so if there's alcohol around about the tissues, the liver cells will be able to take up fats as normal. They will be able to take in carbohydrates and proteins and sometimes convert components of those to fatty acids as normal. And what the liver cell would normally do is excrete these fats to be stored in various parts of the body. So the alcohol does not affect the ability of the cell to take in fats, but it does affect the ability of the cell to excrete the fats. And if the cell can take in fats but can't export them, then the fats are going to accumulate in the liver cells. And this is exactly what happens. The liver cells will enlarge, the nucleus will still be there, but it will be pushed to the side by a large fatty containing vacuole in the cell. And the liver cell will become fatty. So if this was a normal sized liver here, here we have a normal sized liver. Then after some time of uh, heavy drinking, that liver is going to become enlarged and it's going to be yellowish and fatty. It's going to be a fatty liver. 
This is called steatosis. Steatosis is liver fat. And very often, like me, probably what you've done is imagine this is the uh, this is the person's torso here. And here's the diaphragm, the bottom, let's say that's the bottom of the ribs there. Now the liver is going to be in this kind of position here, but it's normally going to be under the ribs. So sometimes in a very thin person, you can just feel the, the bottom edge, the bottom, the, that bottom rim of the liver there when they breathe in, when you put your fingers over to feel it, to palpate the liver. But if the liver's enlarged, then what happens is you can feel the liver and you can feel it below the costal margin. It will stick out below the costal margin and you can feel it. I feel it and you can work out whether it's one finger enlarged, two fingers enlarged, three fingers enlarged. It's a good rule of uh, thumb just to start the investigation off. So you can talk about a one finger liver, which is that far below the costal margin, two finger liver, three finger liver, uh, as the liver becomes progressively enlarged. And we identify the hepatomegaly. And the other thing, of course, is when we percuss, we will find that the bowel sound is hollow, but the sound over the liver gives a more ho uh, um, um, gives a more solid type of sound. So we get a more hollow sound over the abdomen because there's air and gas in the intestines, but this would sound much more solid if the liver was enlarged. Now, when the liver's enlarged and fatty, it's reversible. This is the key thing. This is the key thing to get to patients because it's the presence of the alcohol that is preventing the export of the fat. So if we take away the alcohol, then the fat can be exported from the cell again as normal. And that means the individual hepatocytes will get smaller and it means the liver will get smaller and the liver can go back to normal size. So in, in the short term, this steatosis, this alcohol-induced steatosis is reversible. But if it's prolonged for a period of time, that's going to cause some inflammation round about the liver. There's going to be a hepatitis, an alcohol-induced steatohepatitis, inflammation associated with the steatosis. And that will result in the death of progressive death of liver cells. And the dead liver cells over time are going to be produced by fibrous tissue. And this can result in cirrhosis. So the, the good news is that we have this period of opportunity before it becomes inflamed and certainly before it becomes uh, cirrhotic. Where, where the person can stop drinking and, and the liver can recover. And the liver does have remarkable powers of regeneration. Now, another thing that the liver does in relation to fats is the liver produces the lipoproteins, both high and low density li lipoproteins are synthesized in the liver. It actually makes them, the HDL and the LDL. So the liver is actually producing the HDL and the LDL high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein. The liver is synthesizing these carrier molecules. And these are protein based transporter molecules which carry things like cholesterol, phospholipids, triglycerides around the body. So they're the transporter molecules because of course the fatty things like the triglycerides and the cholesterol and the phospholipids they can't be circulated around the body in the blood because the fats and the water won't mix. Fats are described as, as hydrophobic. Fats won't dissolve in water, so they must be carried in these carrier molecules. And basically speaking, the LDL takes fat from the liver and puts it into the blood. So it circulates around the body in the blood. Now, in our Western situation, this is actually bad because it means we're putting more cholesterol 
more fats into the blood. And that is associated with the development of disease processes. Atheroma is the fatty material that can accumulate inside the arterial lumens, making heart attack and uh, stroke and peripheral vascular disease more likely. So we think of the LDL cholesterol as bad cholesterol. That's why we take statins to, to lower the LDL. Statins will inhibit the formation of LDL in the liver. But the HDL on the other hand, the HDL is taking fats that are in the blood already and it's transporting those fats to the liver for chemical processing. So the liver is excreting the HDL, but the HDL is then carrying the fats back to the liver. So we often describe the HDL as healthy cholesterol, H for healthy, or the good cholesterol. So ideally you want your LDL to be low and your HDL to be high. And we know that things like smoking will lower HDL and we know that exercise will raise HDL. But of course that begs the question, if, if this LDL is so unhealthy, why, why do we have it in the first place if all this LDL is causing our, our blood vessels to, to clog up with atherosclerosis? Well, the answer goes back to this idea that the liver is designed to help us survive. It's a survival organ. And if there's no food for a long period of time in a hunter-gatherer situation, then we need metabolic substrates so that all the cells of the body can produce energy. And over a long period of time, fats will produce a lot of energy. They produce it slowly, but they release it over a long period of time. So we can make the 30, 40 mile walk to the next waterhole. We can wait a few weeks for the crops to come. We can wait a while while the young men make a kill and we can eat meat again. So it keeps us alive during periods where food is not readily available because we need these fats in the blood to provide energy and the LDL will be transporting fats from the liver into the blood to keep us alive in emergency situations where food is not available or large amounts of exercise are required. So LDL is only a problem, it's got a bit of a bad press, but it's only a problem if we're in societies like ours where food is readily available. Where, where, where it does the opposite of helps us survive, it causes, it causes disease. But in the primitive situation where we are designed to live, the liver does this brilliant job of producing this low density lipoprotein that keeps fatty nutrients in the blood to keep us producing energy. So that was a quick review where we look at the storage of some nutrients. We looked at carbohydrate metabolism and we looked at some aspects of fat metabolism. In the next clip we'll go on and think about the liver's activity in protein metabolism.